Welcome to Seder and Song, a project of the Drisha Institute for Jewish Education. I am Noah Batmiri, and I'm here with Rabbi David Silber, the founder and dean of Drisha. And we are going to be talking about the Seder. You will hear four voices, my own, that of Rabbi David Silber, that of a clarinet played by Mr. Andy Statman, and that of a piano played by Mr. Abai Steinmetz Silber. We hope that you enjoy the conversation. Welcome back to the Drisha Institute for Jewish Education's project on Song and Seder. This is our second session on telling the story. Welcome back, Rabbi Silver. Thank you. Good to be here. So what is special about the way that the Haggadah instructs us to tell the story? Well, the Haggadah actually... um, the telling of the story, of course, which is the first half of the Seder, essentially. It's interesting to see that what the Haggadah seems to focus on, for starters, is question and answer. And that comes in different forms, but it starts with what's known typically as the four questions, the Manishtana, typically asked traditionally by a young child. And... uh, there weren't always four questions, but there were always questions. It starts off with three questions. There's a whole history to the four questions. But for our purposes, there are questions and there's a response. And then later, in the section called Magid, the telling, the Haggadah speaks of four different kinds of children who have four different questions, or one of them doesn't even ask a question, and we respond differently someone is responding to the child, to each child, in a different way. So once again, it's about question and answer. Then in the Haggadah, towards the beginning, there's a story of five sages who were sitting in Bnei Brak, five very well-known sages from the rabbinic tradition, Rabbi Akiva and others, and they were together in Bnei Brak on the night of Passover, and they were talking with each other, presumably studying with each other all night, and so engrossed that their pupils came to them in the morning and said, our teachers, it's time to recite the morning Shema. The night is over. They weren't, didn't realize, that they were so engrossed, they didn't realize the night is over. And then it's interesting also, as has been noted by others, as well as myself, that within that section, statements that are found in the primary sources that are not questions. For example, the ritual, the rituals of eating the matzah, the sacrificial offering when we had sacrifices, the Passover, the Pesach, the bitter herbs. The Mishnah says we eat these things, they recall and they explain each one, but in the Haggadah it's put in terms of a question. The matzah that we eat tonight, why do we eat it? So the Haggadah reframes statements into questions. And then the way we end the first half of the Seder, Psalm 114, B'tzeit Yisrael mi Mitzrayim, is also questions. The psalmist asks the rivers and the mountains, Malachah hayam ki tanus? Why, why rivers do you flee? Why Jordan do you go backwards? Hayadein tisov liachar. Heharim rakadu ki The mountains skip like, like rams. Why is that? So there are questions. So the entire first half is all about question and answer. And the other piece of it, which is interesting, is that we are obligated to tell the story. And telling the story suggests that there's somebody to whom you tell the story. 
you're speaking to somebody else. And we know that depending who the other person is, when we speak to the other, even when we speak at different occasions to the same person, it's never exactly the same. Because there's somebody listening, there's somebody processing what you're saying, there's somebody questioning. So the Haggadah then instructs us, I would say, to be fully engaged. These sages were up the entire night without realizing the night was over. So there's a sense of being engrossed, and there's a sense, of course, at the core of it is question and response. Okay, so as you just said, uh, question and answer, call and response, this uh, back and forth, this engagement in most cases between two parties, even, you know, one of the names for matzah is the bread of questions. Why are questions and answers so central? What is this about? Why? Why? Um, well, I think that part of it is, you know, sometimes people say the question is more important than the answer. I don't believe that's true. I don't think that makes any sense. But I would say something else. You'll never get to the answers without the questions. And I think what the what our tradition is encouraging us to do is to ask questions. And to ask questions from where we are. You know, it's interesting that another piece of the telling is what the Mishnah calls Midrash. The night of Passover, they give us a, t- a particular text to read, which is four verses long. It's not from the book of Exodus. It's from Sefer Devarim, Deuteronomy. Read these verses. It's the pilgrim's prayer who brings the first fruits to the temple. Read these verses and be doresh. Study them carefully. So we are instructed to study carefully. And the idea of being doresh, of midrash, is to ask questions from where we are. And the assumption is that these ancient texts Within these texts, if we look at them carefully and uh, critically, that we're able to find within these texts some answers to, to our questions. So the Doresh is the attempt to bridge the gap between the ancient on one hand and the present on the other. So you get there by asking questions. That's the first point. And in general... And this, that's the obligation, to take four verses and try to find all this meaning within these four verses. And then there's the other side of it, of the saper. The Haggadah says, in the very beginning of the Haggadah, mitzvah aleinu l'saper b'tziat mitzrayim. There's an obligation, l'saper, to tell the story. A sipur is a story, to tell the story. And the truth is that our tradition instructs us to remember the Exodus every single day. In fact, twice a day. The Haggadah even cites the source for that. The dispute, is it once a day or twice a day? So every day, we are instructed to remember the Exodus. So what is special about the night of Passover? And what's special is, it's not about memory. It's about telling the story. It's about involving the other. And the sense of involving the other, which is deeply connected to community, and after all, Passover is the creation of the Jewish people, the Jewish community, Uh, the idea of engaging the other and in two different senses. One is in terms of study, because you want to hear the questions and you want to hear a different point of view. The five sages were up all night and these sages disagree with each other in the Talmud, right and left. The Talmud's all about disagreement. Two sides. It's always important to hear the other side. Not necessarily because you adopt the other side, but because it allows you to question your own opinion and to refine your own opinion. Sometimes you say you're wrong and you accept the other opinion. But more often than not, it helps you to understand what you actually think and what you actually believe and what you think is right. And the interesting thing is that on two different occasions during the Seder, we try to engage the other. The first time is towards the very beginning of the Seder. Before we start telling the story, we invite guests to come in. It is ceremony. We've already made Kiddush. We've already started. But the idea is we invite people to come. We want to, them to be involved in telling the story. We want to hear what they have to say. And we want them to hear what we have to say. 
And then later, after the meal, it's an ancient custom to open up the door. And it's, sometimes we say we're inviting Elijah the prophet into the house. But the custom to open the door precedes, as far as we can tell, any mention of Elijah. But it precedes the recitation of the Hallel, of the Song of Gratitude, the completion of those that Song of Gratitude. And the fact of the matter is that in that psalm called Hallel, Psalm 118, we say the person who has been delivered from a personal sorrow, from a personal suffering, says, I want to go, lo amut ki echia. I live, and I want to go, va saper, and I will tell the story of divine assistance. And actually, in that Hallel, in Psalm 116, we have a similar statement. Someone's been delivered, a near-death experience, and the response is, I have to go and do something. And the question that the Hallel says, Psalm 116, how can I repay? How can I repay the kindnesses? And the answer in Psalm 116 is, I will go and bring a sacrifice. And where will I do this? In the courtyards of God, before all of the people. I will make a public statement. I will tell others. I will share my experience. So the idea of sharing experiences is central, the sipur, the telling of the story, the telling of my story, is central both when it comes to study, that's the first half of the Seder, and it's central when it comes to expressions of gratitude, of, of deliverance. There's a religious obligation to tell the story. Here's a nigun, written, written for the words, L'cha ezbach zevach toda. I will bring a sacrifice of gratitude, a thanksgiving sacrifice. The melody is the melody of Shlomo Kalbach. So uh, in the Jewish world, there is always an ongoing disagreement um, about many things, but uh, is the Torah poetry or a song or just a prose story? And I'm wondering if you have a sense of 
how the Haggadah fits into that. Are we supposed to sing it or just read it? Or well, I grew up with my my father, who uh, we all s- said everything together at the Seder. My father would lead it, and he would chant the Haggadah. And I, in many, uh, I don't know if this is a common practice today, but um, we would chant the Haggadah. It had, had a chant to it, and that's not really surprising because when you think about it, the sacred texts that we read are never just read. They're always chanted. The Torah reading that we do every Shabbat, during the week, the festivals, etc., there is called Tamei HaMikra. There's cantillation. And there are different traditions. The Ashkenazic Jews have more than one tradition. The, the German Jews have their own musical notes, their own music to it, a little different. The Sephardic Jews, the Eastern, has Eastern music to it and different s- scale, a different way of chanting, but everybody's chanting it. So it's not surprising. And of course, our prayers, Nusach HaTfilo, we have a, there's a whole tremendous field of Nusach, of how one sings the prayers. The Torah is called a song. Write down this song, we are instructed at the end of the Torah, and the rabbinic understanding is write down the song means the whole Torah. So it's, it's more than just the words. And yes, we would chant the Haggadah. I'll chant a couple of lines from the Haggadah myself. This is what we would say. I'll give you a couple of examples. It's pretty much the same. We were slaves in Egypt. Avadim hoyinu refaro b'mitzrayim v'yot tzienu Hashem misham b'yod chazokol v'zro anetu yor v'yigu lo hoti ha-kodesh baruch v'savol seinu mi-mitzrayim arei anu v'neinu v'nei v'neinu mishubadim hoyinu refaro b'mitzrayim v'yafiru kulanu chachamim kulanu zekeinim kulanu nevonim or another section. But would be the entire Haggadah we would chant this way. The verses that describe uh, God passing through Egypt on the night of Passover, the slaying of the firstborn, the redemption of Israel, that's how we would chant it. And the whole Seder was that way. Thank you. So, what, in your opinion, is the core idea of the Haggadah? If you had to get it down to uh, a tweet or, you know, put it on one foot. <laughs> uh, in my opinion, the absolute central idea of the Haggadah is the, is the covenant. The Haggadah sees the exodus from Egypt as a fulfillment of a prior promise. The promise made to Avraham in chapter 15 of the book of Breshit, Genesis chapter 15, where God promised Avraham a child and possession of this land in which God is present. And Avraham asks God the question, which means, through what will I know we shall inherit it? Covenant is a two-sided agreement. What is our commitment? You commit to the land, you promise me an heir, succession. What's our obligation? And God says, know very well. It's a very big, high price for this. And God says three things. Your descendants will be strangers, gerim, They'll be enslaved, and they'll be abused. Gerut avdut ve'inui. Those three terms, that's the price. For those who want to enter the covenant, have to be willing to pay that price. And those three terms appear in the beginning of the book of Exodus, 
in a description of the situation, the experience of Mitzrayim. So we see this experience, what's important for the Haggadah is not the facts of history. It's more the interpretation of history. And the experience of being enslaved, of suffering, of being marginalized, that experience is seen as covenantal. And we rejoice, we celebrate the leaving of Egypt, but we have to come to terms with what that experience was, and of course we have to process it, and we have to figure out how that speaks to us moving forward. Why is it so important? Why in the Torah is it so important to remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt? And I think there are many good answers to that question. But that is the core, the basis point of the, of the Seder. To understand the Seder is covenantal. And I think here, it would be good to listen to a nigun of... Uh, Andy will play. Andy Stappen will play the nigun of the of Michal of Zlachev. Michal of Zlachev was a pupil of the Maggid of Mezrich, Baal Shem Tov, and this is one of his nigunim. I think you can feel the exile in this particular nigun.
so uh, you mentioned at length uh, this idea of the covenant as the central idea of the Haggadah. Where is it actually spelled out in the Haggadah? I think it's spelled out pretty explicitly in a short paragraph that we say in the Magid section. This has stood us in every generation. What is Vihi? And Vihi, this, refers to the covenant. This covenant, this, this experience, covenantal experience, the Haggadah makes the claim, perhaps audacious claim, that this experience repeats throughout history. So Vihi Sha'am Delavotainu. This covenantal experience has stood with us, stays with us for all time. We see ourselves as functioning within the covenant. It's a long-term relationship, has like long, all long-term relationships has its ups, its downs. But we we understand ourselves to be within a, a covenantal connection. And I think we should conclude with a song, a nigun. Andy Stappen will play a nigun of, again, from the world of Mudgets, a short nigun, Bihisha Amdal Avotainu.